Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm trying out something new. Inspired by fellow booktuber Joel Swagman, I've decided to turn some of the reviews on my book blog, socialbookshelves.com, into video reviews. Each of the reviews I write uses the page count of the book as the word count of a review, so longer reviews mean it's a longer book. I'm also a completionist, and so I thought we'd start with an author where I've read the entire bibliography. And so, without further ado, here's what I made of every Colin Dexter book. Last Bus to Woodstock, 1975. You pretty much know what you're getting with a Colin Dexter book, because they're all pretty much the same. And that's not to say that it's a bad thing. In this book, Morse investigates the apparent rape and murder of a young girl, and there are plenty of twists and turns along the way to make sure that you question everything that you thought you knew, and to make you wonder which of the characters might have committed the murder. And, as with most detective novels, there are secondary deaths along the way, although I don't want to tell you why in case I spoil the storyline. Suffice to say that it's an interesting enough read, and Morse is on fine form here, but that there was nothing in particular that made it stand out from the rest of the novels in the series. In fact, at times, I realised that I was reading it without really taking in the meaning of the words. It was like the mental equivalent of my eyes glazing over. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It was an easy read, and I whizzed through it pretty quickly. It's probably best to think of it just as a quick piece of entertainment, rather than a work of art or a piece of fine literature. It's just not that memorable, and I even found that I'd forgotten things while I was reading it. Now, writing this review a couple of days later, it's hard to focus on things. That contrasts sharply with some of Dexter's other Morse novels, which still stand out fresh in my mind even months after reading them. If I were you, I'd work through the other Morse books first. Your call. Last Scene Wearing, 1976 this book is another entry in Colin Dexter's Inspector Moore series, and here we get to watch as the detective is assigned to a cold case. But maybe the case isn't that cold, because some new evidence is discovered and he's given a lead to follow up on. But with no body, it's difficult to prove that a murder has even occurred. It's a tangled web of intrigue that we're looking at here, and we get to see it through his eyes. Of course, Lewis comes into it as well, and he actually provides some useful insights, although it's ultimately Morse who does most of the investigation. But will he find the answer out too late? One of the things that I liked about this book was that Dexter did a great job of introducing you to his world. Morse works in and around Oxford, which isn't far from me, and I even spotted a reference to High Wycombe, which is where I live. Because of that, it makes the story somehow more enjoyable, at least for me. The characters also feel real, and even though it's set very much amongst the generation before mine, they were also easy to relate to in some ways. And of course, there's the fact that it's easy to read this, and the pages just whiz past. I read the whole book across the space of a couple of days, and there was never a dull moment. Even the initial build-up wasn't as slow as it was in some of the other Morse books, and I felt like the motives were well thought out and realistic, and introduced slowly, more like a dawning epiphany than a sudden slap in the face. Overall then, I enjoyed this as much as, if not more than, the other Morse books that I've read, and it definitely left me wanting to read the rest of the books in the series. It's not a bad place to start if you're new to Dexter's work, so go ahead, enjoy it. The Silent World of Nicholas Quinn, 1977. Morse is back, baby. It's pretty natural for me to be a Colin Dexter reader because I'm such a huge fan of both Agatha Christie and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dexter isn't as good, but he's still pretty damn good. He has the same attention to detail that the other two writers had, but he does occasionally slip into cliché. Still, with no more Conan Doyle to read and precious little Christie, I can't help but love his work. This book focuses on the murder of a deaf guy called Nicholas Quinn, who worked on the board of invigilators for the old school O-level exam board. The interesting thing about his murder is that there's no obvious motive, and it takes quite a while for the reader to get settled into the circumstances which led to his murder. Morse, meanwhile, is coming along in leaps and bounds, but he remains tight-lipped and so you have to guess what he's thinking. It's a great read, and the plot really roars along as the pace picks up, and I love the way that the twists and turns are so closely related to the characters. Chance doesn't play a part here, everything's meticulously planned and meticulously deduced. And in what may be a world first, the fact that most of the characters felt fundamentally unlikable to me didn't hamper my enjoyment of the book. If anything, it just made me more determined to see that the culprit was brought to justice. The ending left me a little confused at times, but overall it made sense and I say yeah, read it. Service of All the Dead, 1979 the first thing to mention here is that this book is one of the Inspector Morse books, and indeed we get to hear a lot from the great detective here. Lewis, his faithful accomplice, doesn't get as much of a look in until halfway through, but when he does come in, his part is triumphant and he's the perfect sidekick. What's interesting to note is that the storyline follows the church, and whilst I'll admit that I'm a lifelong atheist, I still found it interesting to take a look behind the scenes at the clergy, and it's clear that Dexter did his research. 
It's a decent enough mystery, but it doesn't stand above the other Morse books for me. In parts, it was a little complicated, with some characters posing as other characters and murky motives that I didn't fully understand at the end of it. I wasn't sure if it was actually enough to explain why someone would become a multiple murderer. But I read through it quickly enough. I got from start to finish in a couple of days. It's a gripping story that keeps you powering through and there are plenty of characters to choose from, and it's interesting to see Morse get up to his usual tricks. There are also a couple of references to his lack of a first name. Through the series, it's never revealed, which is an interesting little quirk. And the good thing about Colin Dexter's books is the way that you can read them out of order without losing anything. Honestly, I have no idea which order you're actually supposed to read them in, but that's one of its unique benefits. That also means you can skip this one and read one of the better books, then come back to it later on. The Dead of Jericho, 1981 If you've ever read a Colin Dexter book before, then you should already know what to expect here. Dexter is a competent crime writer, and Inspector Morse has gone down in history of one of literature's great detectives. I'm not convinced that he's on a par with Sherlock Holmes or Hercule Poirot, but he is still a lot of fun to read, especially if you're working on a crime novel of your own, like I am. In this book, Morse and Lewis get up to their usual tricks, investigating a murder in Oxford. Morse himself had a connection with the victim, albeit a brief one, and she's not the only corpse to show up throughout the novel. For me, The Dead of Jericho was a little below par for a Morse novel, although it still holds up its own against other crime books on the market. I read it in a couple of days, which is good. I sped through it, but the plot seemed to go in one ear and out the other, and only when Morse explained what had actually happened at the end of the book was I able to totally understand the storyline. So overall, I wouldn't recommend starting with this book if you're new to the Inspector Moore series, but if you've read one of the books before and you enjoyed it, then you're sure to enjoy this one too. As for me, I'm planning on reading through each of the books, but I don't think that the death of Anne Scott will keep me up at night. That said, the victims of a crime novel never seem to stick out to me, it's usually the living that you remember. The Riddle of the Third Mile, 1983 Okay, let's lay down some truth on this one. I read over half of this book, the second half, whilst getting the train home on Christmas Eve. Beer was involved. I don't really remember the final 50 pages. Still, it was alright. It was eminently readable, although maybe not as addictive as some of the other Morse novels that I read. In fact, I'd potentially reread this again in the future so that I could pick up on some of the subtle nuances that passed me by this time round. Loosely speaking, the storyline follows Morse's investigation when a body is discovered which is missing its head, its arms and its legs. This makes identification difficult, if not impossible. And we're forced to ask ourselves, as the reader, why somebody would go to that much effort. Are they trying to hide the identity of the victim? Perhaps. There was a big twist at the end of the book which added an additional element to the storyline, but I struggled to follow the train of thought that led to the conclusion. In some ways, this spoiled the book for me. It felt like I'd spent ages reading up on the history of the case, and then the denouement at the end was whizzed over. But again, that could be the beer. So overall, I'd say that this book was okay, but there are better Colin Dexter books on the market. Read this only if you've worked through the others. The Secret of Annex 3, 1986 To a certain extent, you know what you're getting with a Colin Dexter book. Here, we follow Inspector Morse as he investigates a murder that took place on New Year's Eve at a hotel. The hotel had recently undergone some redevelopment, and so some of the guests were staying in a small annex off to the side of it. Morse is tasked with finding out what happened inside the titular third annex, and rest assured that there are plenty of twists and turns along the way. The characters are good enough, but not particularly memorable. That seems to happen a lot in detective novels, for some reason. It's because they're so human and so dispensable. They have their foibles, like we all do, and whilst the story is largely experienced through the relationships between each of the characters, once it's over they seem to fade away. Still, Morse and Lewis are at their strongest here, and the locations that are featured feel both believable and real, as though you yourself are walking amongst them. In many ways, it helps to draw you, as the reader, into the story, and so you're able to try to solve the mystery yourself, and, like all good mystery novels, it keeps you guessing along the way, and, for me at least, it'd be easy to reread it and to get drawn back into the storyline. Overall then, this was probably one of my favourites of the Inspector Morse novels, and it seems as good a book as any for you to get started with. The writing is swift and easygoing, and it leaves you feeling satisfied when you get to the end of it. What more could you ask for? The Wench is Dead, 1989 I'm probably a little predisposed towards Colin Dexter because I've read all of the Sherlock Holmes books and most of Agatha Christie's back catalogue, and so this is the natural next step. The Wench is Dead is a little different to most of the other books in that Morse is an invalid throughout. He got hospitalised for being a middle-aged pisshead. Anyway, the actual mystery involved here begins to develop when Morse begins to read one of his fellow patients' write-ups of a century-old murder case. It turns out he has a few doubts about whether the official version of events, which led to the execution of several men, was ever the case at all. 
And so, in between reading blue novels, when he thinks no one is looking, and trying to recover from his illness, Morse's mind begins to unravel the problem like one of the crossword puzzles that he's fond of. This is one of the quickest Morse novels to read, and it was also a gripping story, and so it's a pretty good introduction to his work. That said, I'm yet to read most of the rest of Dexter's work, and I'm willing to bet that there'll be a better introduction to his stuff in there somewhere. Bear with me while I look into that for you. The Jewel That Was Ours, 1991 In many ways, this started out as an anachronism for me. It says on the cover that it's the new Inspector Morse, but I came to this after I'd already read the last book in the series. The reason for that is pretty simple. I picked this book up a little while back and didn't enjoy it, and so I didn't finish it and gave my copy away. Then I read the rest of the Morse series, and so I realised that I had to give it another chance. And I'm glad I did, although I do stand by the fact that it started out slowly and didn't seem like much fun. I had the same problem this time round. But I have no fear, once you get into it, you're in for an exciting ride. It's also noteworthy because to begin with, we're not even sure whether this is a murder. It could just be that someone had a heart attack and someone else decided to rob them rather than calling for help. But you'll find out all about that when you trudge through the initial setup. After that, you're in for a roller coaster ride that challenges your suppositions and keeps you guessing right up until the very end. Because of that slow start, I wouldn't say that this is one of the best Morse novels, but I'd say it's one of the better ones. I'd recommend it in a heartbeat if you've read another one of the Morse books and enjoyed it. The Way Through the Woods, 1992 This is the first Colin Dexter book that I've ever read, and I wasn't sure what to expect. I was hoping to find that he writes like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Agatha Christie, and I wasn't disappointed. Dexter can write a cracking crime novel, and Morse is a fascinating character, just like Poirot, Holmes and the other great detectives in the world of literature. The story follows Morse's investigation into the disappearance and presumed death of a young girl. He's a reluctant hero, as he's on holiday at the time, but he's still a hero. If that reminds you of Sherlock Holmes, then I'm not surprised. Dexter clearly takes a lot of inspiration from the great crime writers of old, and Conan Doyle was the best of the best. But this book was so much more than just an imitation of Sherlock Holmes from another author who wanted to make a name for themselves. It's a joy to read, incredibly well written, and the story feels truly unique, packed full of twists and turns to keep you interested until the end. Perhaps that's why it won the Gold Dagger Award for the best crime novel of the year. If only I'd known that when I appeared on Pointless, the BBC quiz show. I got to the final round with a chance to grab the jackpot and the question was about Gold Dagger Award winning crime writers. We didn't get it right back then, but there's a sort of poetic justice in the fact that I ended up reading a book which would have won me nearly £10,000 if only I'd read it a couple of years earlier. What a shame. The Daughters of Cain, 1994 This book is yet another instalment in Colin Dexter's Inspector Moore series, and so to a certain extent you know what to expect here. I've never watched the television adaptation of the series, and so I can't tell you how close the TV series and the books are in style and substance, but I will say that I've had a lot of fun reading these. Now, I've read the Morse books out of order, but I don't think it's necessarily important. Certainly this book works well as a standalone, and it's fascinating to see the subtle shifts in power when Morse, Lewis, and Chief Superintendent Strange are all working together to solve a murder case. Here, they're looking into the discovery of a corpse in a flat in North Oxford, which was discovered with a knife through its stomach. Unfortunately, at least to begin with, the police have no leads, and don't even know what the motive might have been. Luckily, with Morse on the case, you know that we're going to get to the truth eventually, even if he does change his mind along the way as new evidence comes to light. Morse is a classic example of the armchair detective, the sort of copper who solves crimes whilst drinking pints in the pub at lunchtime, and who simply needs to go over the case in their head until the truth dawns on them. And of course, there are plenty of twists and turns along the way which keep you, as the reader, guessing about what happened right up until the very end. There's also the inevitable second death, which seems to be a staple in the Morse books. Dexter builds up your expectations and convinces you that one of the characters was the guilty party, and then they get killed and you have to restart your hypotheses. But it works, and it makes for a truly gripping read that's a lot of fun, especially if you're already a fan of detective novels. So what are you waiting for? The Morse books are lots of fun, and while this one doesn't rank above any of the others, it's still a good place to start. Death is Now My Neighbour, 1996 Here we have yet another one of Colin Dexter's Inspector Morse novels, and this particular book takes its title from the fact that the action centres on a small street. There's a murder at one of the houses, and the investigation immediately begins to centre on the other residents of the street. You see, it seems like someone knows something, and in fact there's an entire web of lies and conspiracy that the whole street is tangled up in. One of the problems that I have with detective novels is that it's often difficult to remember all of the different characters who are involved. That wasn't such a problem here, and in fact it was one of the few Morse books that I think I'd struggle to reread because I'd remember all of the different twists and turns that the reader experiences along the way. 
One character in particular, Owens, the murder victim's next door neighbour and a reporter at the local paper, seemed to stand out to me, although I still found that Morse, Lewis and Strange were my favourite characters throughout. It was also interesting to visit Lonsdale College where two men, Julian Storrs and Dr Dennis Cornford, are competing for the position of master. It's intriguing because the academic world of Oxford is so far removed from my own experiences with life and education, and yet Dexter paints such an evocative picture that it's easy to be absorbed by the story. Meanwhile, Morse is facing his own crisis, and it's interesting to learn a little more about the great detective's personal life. In fact, at the end of the book, he even reveals his Christian name to Lewis, something which I didn't expect. You, as the reader, get to find out what that is, and I was under the impression that Morse's first name would never be revealed. Overall then, I'd have to say that this is one of the better Inspector Morse novels, and it was a lot of fun to read. Despite being a little longer than some of the other books in the series, it only took me a couple of days to get through it because it was just so damn addictive. It really was a page turner, the type of detective novel that keeps you guessing right up until the very end. It's just a great read. The Remorseful Day, 1999 the Remorseful Day is the final book in Colin Dexter's Inspector Moore series, and it's certainly true that it does a good job of wrapping up the other books and bringing the series to a close. That said, it just wasn't particularly exciting. It was competent but formulaic, and while it did bring the series to an end, I wouldn't call it triumphant. I also felt that this book, more so than some of the other Morse books, started to feel a little overcomplicated and not in a good way. It felt like the murder that the detectives were supposed to be investigating ended up taking a back seat to a bunch of other subjects that Dexter wanted to round off in the final book, and so it seemed more like a book that was there because it had to be, rather than because anyone particularly wanted it. But perhaps I'm being harsh. For my part, I finished reading the book earlier today, and I still don't really fully understand what happened. It's like when you half watch a TV show and miss an important scene, then spend the rest of the show wondering what's happening. I feel almost disappointed, like it must be my fault that I didn't particularly enjoy it, and perhaps it is. Still, it scores my 7 out of 10 default rating for a professional quality book, because there are no mistakes or typos, apart from the ones that are featured deliberately so that Morse can correct them, and the layout, cover and the overall feel of the book are what you'd expect from a professional publisher. But that's it. It's professional, but fairly meh, and no amount of editing could fix that. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't read this book. It's more of a warning, because I would still recommend it. However, I'd recommend it after you've read the other books, and not just because of the chronology. I'm also worried that if you read this one first, you wouldn't give the other books a chance, and that wouldn't be being fair to them. So overall then, this isn't necessarily a bad book, it just isn't as good as the others. As long as you're happy to take that into consideration before you start reading it, you should be fine, but don't say I didn't warn you. And to its credit, there are occasional flashes of genius where we get to see Morse's mind at work, it's just that they're few and far between. Still, if you're a fan of the series then you'll want to finish it. The Inside Story, 1993 this book was pretty cool, just a short story featuring Inspector Morse with some fun little gimmicks, like a quiz and a crossword at the end. Lots of fun, and a little collector's item too. Morse's Greatest Mystery, 1993 This book was fun, a nice, quick read that features a couple of different short stories about Inspector Morse, including one in which he himself is the victim of a crime, as well as a short story set at Christmas. Perhaps most interestingly of all is the inclusion of a short story about Sherlock Holmes, which was presumably written by Dexter, but reads like it was written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle himself. In fact, I'm pretty sure I've read it somewhere else before. I recommend this one, whether you're a Morse fan or not. So there we have it, that's what I thought of Colin Dexter's books. As always, don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books, and also whether you'd like for me to make this an ongoing series. Hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.